Tonight I'd like to do a song from my new album entitled In Search of Bianco, which is an homage to the great Argentine tango singer Chaim Bianco. And there's actually a bit of family history that goes along with this. I, uh, my grandmother had an aunt named Leah, and she and my great-grandmother, come on, come on, Angel. Come on, she's, she's down, so nobody will notice. <laughs> and she crosses in the bright lights. Thank you, Oh, it's good. I, I, I'm sorry I started without you. <laughs> Don't worry. Anyway, I say I'm doing a song from my new album of Argentine tangos from the great, of the great tango singer Chaim Bianco. And this is a, uh, telling a bit of family history that goes along with this. My grandmother had an aunt, as I said, named Leah, and she and my great-grandmother left their small town in Poland for the bright lights of Vienna, where my great-grandmother married a nice Jewish tailor and eventually moved to the United States and raised a family. Leah chose a less conventional route. She, a uh, number of love affairs, a couple children without the benefit of marriage, and she cut a path, a scandalous path, across Europe into Constantinople. And eventually she emigrated to Argentina, where I guess as the, as the self-help folks would say, she put her life skills to work. And <laughs> she amassed a sizable fortune running the largest bordello in Buenos Aires. <laughs> something, something I'm very proud of, actually. <laughs> I actually thought I was in the wrong family until I got, got the full story on that. Uh, there's some mix-up at the hospital. <laughs> but uh, th there was also a, a tragic uh, leitmotif that ran through her life, which was her attempts at motherhood. As, as I said, she had a, a couple children in Europe, and she was taking them back to Poland to see my great-great-grandmother, and the children were caught in an epidemic and they succumbed. I know, well then she decided that she would join my great grandparents in New York, whereupon she found herself with a couple young cousins. Evidently when you announced you were going to America in those days, they didn't give you little traveling kits, they gave you stray children they had lying around, <laughs> a chance for a new life. So she was on her way here when there was a cholera outbreak on the boat and those children also died. Oh. And they were quarantined in Havana at that point and were not allowed to come to the United States, which is how she ended up in the Argentine. And her final attempt at motherhood was kind of a comic counterpoint to the tragedy that had gone before because she and my great-grandparents decided she would adopt my grandmother's brother, Max, so that she would have an heir for this wealth she was accumulating. And Max went down there but uh, eventually he was, pretty soon he was dispatched back up north. And for an insight into Uncle Max and why it probably didn't work out, during the Depression, Max, who had never held a job in the best of times, was, uh, was given a job by his brother-in-law out of pity at a uh, furniture factory he had down in Chelsea. So Max went to work and then set about organizing the workers and led them out on strike. <laughs> Troublemaking. <laughs> Another family trait that I seem <laughs> kind of identify with, but whatever. So Leah was often spoken of because my grandmother ended up with a nice inheritance from her, but nobody was supposed to know where the money came from. This was never talked about, right? I remember one time my, uh, my grandmother had this big diamond ring and I was, I was looking at it and I was, okay, I was trying it on, all right? Ah. <laughs> Even then I knew the importance of accessories, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so I was <laughs> trying on this ring and I asked my grandmother where it came from and she said from her aunt. And with no further query on my part, she said, and we didn't ask where it came from. In those days, we didn't care. We were grateful. We didn't care how you got the money. We were just happy to have nice things. Ah. It was a bit defensive. I guess as the daughter of immigrants, she was striving for respectability. As her grandson, I was safely assimilated in this country with even a few capillaries of Shawnee blood, so I've spent my life striving to avoid respectability. <laughs> One of the 
few things I can say I've actually been successful at. <laughs> but uh, thank you. Thank you for applauding. Thank you for my various failures. And you enjoy that. <laughs> Glad I can turn my pain into entertainment. <laughs> I, uh, but, so, among the other souvenirs of my Argentine legacy was a, a box of uh, old 78s of the great tango singers of the 20s and the 30s. Men like Carlos Gardel, Agustin Magalde, and my favorite, Chaim Bianco. These men gave words to the tango a dance born of the desperate sexuality of provincial brothels. A dance so erotic, a few strains of its pulsating rhythms could give you oozing sores in the most uncomfortable places. <laughs> so as a boy, I played these old records and I sang along. And Tonight, through the miracle of modern technology, I'm actually going to do one of those Natalie Cole sing along with the dead person things. <laughs> and join Bianco in a duet of one of his, his greatest hits, Angora, which loosely translates as Angora. <laughs> <laughs> they say that when Bianco sang Angora, he could not only get into a woman's pants, but into her shoes, her dress, and her soft angora fur. Ah. Ladies and gentlemen, the voice of Chaim Bianco. I need a moment to prepare. <laughs> when I was only a child, I remember my mother would put me to bed in a blanket of blue. None other would do. And as I grew older and taught about women, the feel of that fabric would set my heart swimming away. Right to this end. What can I say? Take my hand, let the ecstasy start, give me your ankle. 